you're at church again. Jesus is excited that you're here. He gets to spend some time with you. He's already been delighted with you, and I hope you are delighted in him because in this series that we're journeying through during this spring season into early part of our summer is looking at the scriptures as they always have been there, but some of those things that we tend to miss. We kind of usually they easily focus on our relationship to Jesus as, as one that, well, well, he just kind of tolerates us. I mean, we know Jesus loves me because we can sing, Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Si Cristo me ama la Biblia. I mean, we can sing it in more than one language. I just did three there, right? It's sign language, Spanish, and English. We know this. We've got this down. But yet when it comes to Jesus loving us, most of us think Jesus loves us because he has to love us. Like he's obligated it's a burden that he has to bear to love you and to love me. And we really don't think that Jesus actually likes us very much. He loves us because he has to love us. It's in his nature. That's how we feel most often. And, and don't raise your hands because maybe you've had this experience in your family. You know, that, that one person in your family who, who you love but you never want to spend any time with, right? I mean, you love them to some degree, because you have to, you just don't, don't like spending any time with them. And, and we kind of think that's that way with Jesus, right? That, that he loves us because he has to, but he doesn't like us very much because we know ourselves so well. We know that we are poor, miserable sinners. We know that we fall short of the glory of God, and all of that is absolutely true. Don't get rid of that. Don't throw that away. But also that's absolutely true because of the cross of Jesus, is that your God, your creator, absolutely delights in you, that he delights in you. And he would love the adventure of following him as one of his disciples to be an adventure of mutual delight, mutual delight, not just you and him, but he in you. And so today, we're spending some more time digging into that mutual delight that God has in you. We've been journeying not just in worship, but, but in small groups and Zoom groups and in individual conversations, social media. I got the book back there. Don't take my book. That's like the only copy I got left right now, okay? But if you didn't get a copy yet, we got more coming in that you can pick on up. Hopefully, they'll be in this week. We'll, we'll put out the word as soon as they'll come in if you didn't get one yet. But the good news is you can just go on our website. And you can listen to the audio book. In fact, a lot of you have been listening. Over hundreds of you have been listening to the audio book on there because it's helpful sometimes to hear a book read out loud. You should do that with the scripture sometimes too. It'll change your perspective, how you hear God's word. That's how we're kind of wired. And so I encourage you to do that. As we dig into this word though, we're kind of looking at discipleship and realizing that the following of Jesus isn't meant to be a burden, but rather that's it meant to be a blessing, a joy. We've made it a burden sometimes because of our poor, miserable sinnerness in us. But yet Jesus actually told us one day in John 10.10, 10, he says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Not someday in heaven, yes, in his presence, but have it abundantly. And the Greek is specific there. It's a present active verb right now. I won't ask you to raise your hands if you feel like you're living an abundant life. But maybe if we can, in these next couple of weeks, take a next step towards that abundant life, maybe make just a couple degrees difference and a shift in a different direction, it might not be complete transformational, but that we can remain, that we can take that step towards delighting in God because of what Christ has done for us. Now, we're spending some time in this book and encourage you in, in those daily readings. And what we're going to look at this morning is we're into this uh, sixth seventh chapter now, I forget, I'm working ahead and working with you, and I'm getting confused where we are, but, but follow the reading guide, that's the best way to go, because the story that, that Justin Rosso, who wrote this book, is going to look at today is a perfect one, starting today, the readings for this week, it gives us a perfect setup for next weekend, because next weekend's an important weekend, right? It is confident, be confident about it, yes, it is Mother's Day. But maybe your, your response to that is a little bit indicative of sometimes how Mother's Day is looked at, right? You've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. Mother's Day, Father's Day, they are not emotionally neutral holidays. For some of us, there's holidays of great joy and celebration and thanksgiving. For others of us, we wish we could just skip it because of the baggage we carry, because of a broken relationship, because of plans not turning out the way that we want. 
And so I want to just say to you, especially this week and the readings coming up, knowing that some of you are, are in a place that's probably pretty raw when it comes to a relationship with your mom or maybe your own relationship as a mom or, or not even being a mom and that desire is in you. So the first couple of readings this day, I want to give you permission, blessing, and encouragement to skip them. Just skip them. Go on to the next image. Go ahead. Come back to that some other time when, that, when it's not so raw and it doesn't hurt so much. But for those of you who, who maybe this image is going to be really helpful, I'm going to encourage you to dig into it and lean into it a lot because it's helpful to see that image that he helps unpack for us that's in the scripture of looking at delight as a relationship between a mother and especially a mother carrying a child and how that's connected with it. And if you're not there, go ahead and skip those readings this week. We're not going to talk so much about that this morning, but I want to encourage you on this journey that we're on, that as you go through it, and I hope you're going through the book or listening to the audio book as you drive around throughout your day, that there's going to be parts of it that are going to be difficult in that journey. Some of it you're going to question. Maybe you're going to push back on. That's okay. That's part of our growth, that tension that we have. We want to build our muscles. We don't want to just go along. We want to have that tension so that we can become stronger by that word of God dwelling in us. I love this quote that Justin has on page 92 when it comes to the growth of discipleship. He says it this way, and this is going to be uncomfortable for us, I think. Our growth in discipleship is simply coming to a clearer and clearer understanding of our desperate dependence on Jesus for absolutely everything. That dependence on Jesus is a great gift. That dependence is not intended as a burden, but as a joy. When's the last time you thought to yourself, I am joyfully dependent on another person or anything else? We don't think of dependence as something good. We even have a day in our calendar called Independence Day. Independence is something we strive for. We, we want to be able to make it on our own. We want to be able to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We want to be able to plan ourselves into safety and protection. We don't like feeling or being dependent. But when it comes to our relationship with Christ, when it comes to discipleship, discipleship is absolutely dependent on dependence. I know. Think about it. Dependent on dependence. And if that seems like too big of a jump, jump. as I was working on the message this week, God, I think, is helping help me out a little bit because dependence sounded a lot uncomfortable, but I, I, I trust it. It's there, and I want to move in that direction. And I think moving in that direction, maybe the first step is going back to some another word that we hear repeated over and over today in our, in our readings and that resonated with me by the Spirit this week working on this message. And that's another word that is abide. Abide. In fact, you, you see it on there on your bulletin on the back. There's an outline there. You can follow along if you want to there, fill in some blanks. But this word uh, abide, it's a word we heard Jesus say in the gospel reading. It's a word that John wrote to the early church as they struggled through this following of Jesus, that word abide. It's a word that was spoken over to me because that John 15, that was, my, that was my confirmation passage that was spoken over me some 30 years ago. Abide, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a person abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. I remember that word. And then there's another thing I thought of. Because one of the images that we're going to hear this week is not just of a woman, but a mighty warrior who delights and who sings over his daughter. And I thought about singing. And I thought about those readings. And I thought about a song that, that still resonates in my soul that has that word abide in it, and it's abide with me. It's a powerful song for me because it took me back to my time in, in college at Concordia University in Chicago. And I remember there at, at that, in the university and the evening service that we would have sometimes on Wednesday night. Wednesday night about, I think it was 10 o'clock at, at night. I, I might be wrong on that. My wife will correct me later if that's the case. But the service was a powerful one for me because it was one that we, we just used our voices. There weren't any instruments. There weren't any, you know, any accompaniment to go with it. It was just voices of some one, two, three hundred people singing together. 
Now, what made it powerful is that Concordia is known for their music program. So we got music majors and music teachers and, and mu music professors and, and people who can sing like really, really well, like professionally and in instruments. And so when we sang together in, in, in harmony, nothing against your singing, okay? Nothing against your singing, but I mean, it's, it's like mine. We're not professionals, but, but there was something about that when all of a sudden you're singing together songs in this cavernous space and it's echoing off and it's dark at night and the room is dark and you hear words pounding through and, and it's songs being sung in four-part harmony to perfection or as near as you can get on this earth. And you heard psalms like this, abide with me, which says, abide with me, fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. And you sing those words over and over again, five verses. And that word abide is repeated over and over again, echoing off the cavernous chapel walls. As we come together and we put this request before Jesus, Jesus, abide with us, abide with us. To hear him say in response, yes, I will. I'm with you. You can depend on me. And in that moment, you realize, okay, I don't have to do this. It's not up to me. It's up to him and my abiding in him. Jesus says it this way, and I want you to listen to this reading from John 15, verse, verses 4 through 9. i got some of the words on the screen, but I want you to count to yourself how many times Jesus says the word abide. John 15, 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered, thrown into a fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Were you able to count them up? Eight times. That's how many times Jesus says something about abiding in him. And after he goes through that eight times in those short verses, just five verses, eight times, he says, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. I think so often we get to the end of this and Jesus says this, and then we kind of think to ourselves, okay, Jesus, what do, I have to like, what do I have to actually do? And Jesus says again, let me tell you again, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. And he, then we're like, okay, okay, what do we have to do for you though, Jesus? And Jesus comes back again. He says, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me, abide in me. And we struggle because abiding in him is really depending on him. And, and we want to kind of say, okay, well, what do I have to do? Where do I sign up? And Jesus said, don't worry about that yet. Just abide in me, abide in me, and then you'll, you'll bear much fruit. It's, it's not about your strength. It's not about your power. It's not about your skills. It's about your abiding, remaining, staying in me. Live in that. And if it was that simple, then John wouldn't have had to write about it when he writes a letter. His very first letter to the early church is about this struggle about our performance versus our abiding in Christ Jesus. He says it to them this way when it comes to love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. Beloved, that fits with our series. That's our identity. That's who we are, not given to us, or given to us, not earned by us. If God so loved us, is there any doubt? I mean, look at the record. We, we can see what his love looks like. Then it gets tricky. We also ought to love one another. There's that tricky word, not love, but ought. When we, see, when we hear that word ought, our immediate thing is like, oh, that's what I got to do. I ought to do that, so I got to do this burden. I've got to carry this load. I, I got this obligation that I have to do. Love is an obligation, and so then we're back at the very starting point. We're not living in mutual delight, but living as if our delight is depending upon our performance. In the context of what John is laying out here and repeating the teaching of Jesus, it's not about our performance. It's about our abidance, our remaining, our dependence on Jesus. 
He says it later. I mean, look at, look at how many times he says it in verse 15 and 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We can replace the word depend as well. That's a little bit more uncomfortable. But four times again in these two verses, this word abide comes back. Remaining in Jesus, that our growth as disciples is simply coming again to that clearer and clearer understanding of our desperate dependence on Jesus for absolutely everything. There's a great passage that I've been referring to a little bit as we've gone along in this series. It's in the book of Zephaniah. Now, Zephaniah is one of the shortest books in the Bible. It's only three chapters long, and if you've ever read it, you probably didn't get very far, probably didn't get past chapter two, because if you read it, it's a kind of depressing book. It's a book uh, filled with condemnation, filled with God trying to call back a group of people who had hardened their hearts against him, who had turned their backs against God and his word, or an open and wanton rebellion against him. It's hard words to hear and to read, powerful words of judgment. But when you get to verse 14, that judgment is still there. There is still judgment over sin, but there's a good news, a miraculous news, that there is mercy. And mercy, mercy triumphs over judgment. Hear these words from Zephaniah 3, 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. Look at that title that he gives to the people. He calls them not, uh, gives them this beautiful name. He calls them twice in here. He calls them daughters. Daughters. Daughters, the threat of your sin, the, this stuff you have done. The threat of the sin that has been done against you. My daughters, I've got good news. It's been dealt with by your dad. Your dad who is the Lord and the King, which causes you to sing, which can cause you to rejoice because it's been done for you. But you are not the only one who gets this delight and this joy. No, it's a mutual delight. Look at how it continues. Verse 16, on that day they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. He will sing over you? Yeah. And I know for those of you who are doubting, does, does God, I mean, I know God loves me. Does, does he really like me? He longs to sing over you, his daughter, his son, whom he's rescued, whom he's redeemed, whom he's brought back to the way that you were made to be in his image without sin and do that perfection. And he longs for that day when he can sing over you. I like how Rasal describes it in page 95 of the book. He says, we get to see that moment when the still hot from battle, the mighty warrior finds his darling daughter through the fray. He rushes to her, picks her up in his arms, twirls her around in joy. The battle took its toll. The mighty warrior is bruised and bloodied. He bears wounds in his hands and side, but the joy, the joy of being reunited with his darling makes it all worthwhile. The enemies have been defeated. The danger and the fear have fled. Now, finally, the embattled warrior surrounds his daughter with loving arms. His delight overflows until her song of joy is drowned out by the victorious hymn of the king. Can you see it? Can you imagine it? Can you long for it? It may be hard because we don't want to put ourselves back as that child who's dependent, but yet we are that child who is dependent. We might have grown up, but our dependence still hasn't changed upon our God. 
And we know this most fair, most, uh, most especially when the thing that's staring us at our faiths that we've tried to keep away from us for the longest, that we've done everything we can to keep from coming, is there staring us at in our face and we can't do anything to stop it. And that thing that we fear the most, that we try to keep at arm's length, that we try to avoid, that we try to prevent more than anything else, is our death. And in our death, our dependence comes roaring back. Comes roaring back with the promise of a mighty king. A mighty king who wants to sing over his daughter and his son. As all those images were, were twirling in my mind this week, I was paying attention and thinking about times in my ministry where on your behalf, I've had the privilege to sit at the bedside of somebody who, with whom we, we knew their death was near. Their breathing was getting shallow, organs are shutting down, and you know, you know death is coming. And as hard as those moments are at times, sometimes those moments are, are beautiful too. Beautiful in the sense that you know the way that person is going. You know that man, that woman, that, that child, that they belong to the king of kings. And I remembered one particular moment in particular this past uh, that happened almost, I guess, almost 10 years, more than 10, year, 10 years ago now. Wow. And it happened on September 18th in 2011. I'll tell you the story so I can paint the whole connection for you. The story is of a woman in our congregation. Her name was Anna Mae Tramp. And I had the privilege to be there at her bedside along with her daughter, Linda, on that September day when we knew death was, was evident. Her battle against cancer, she fought hard, but was coming to an end. Her breathing was labored. Her organs were shutting down. She was passing in and out of consciousness, and we sat there, her daughter, myself, and Anna Mae just holding hands, praying, reading scripture, talking about memories, talking about Jesus. And something in that moment wasn't me, spirit perhaps. We just started singing there at her deathbed with wobbly, tear-filled voices, singing favorite songs like Amazing Grace. Jesus loves me. And another one. And I can still vividly picture it in my mind. As we sang to her, Hold thou thy cross, before my closing eyes shine through the gloom and point me to the skies heaven's morning breaks and earth's faint shadows flee in life in death O Lord Abide in me. And there was a peace. A peace that could pass understanding. A peace that the world couldn't give because there is no peace in death in the world. But a peace sung through wobbly, tear filled voices in the confidence and sure hope that while the wages of sin was death, that was evident. But also that death didn't get the final say over Anna Mae. Because Anna Mae was saved by her mighty warrior, king, daddy, 
And in water and the word washed by him, claimed, fed at his table. And as she heard wobbly voices of her pastor and her daughter singing, I knew with confidence that there would be a moment not too soon where those wobbly, tear-filled voices would be replaced by the mighty, strong warrior king who would sing over his beloved daughter, whom he would hold in his arms and wipe every tear from his eyes because his daughter was home, his daughter in whom he delivered light and he had a song of joy to sing over her that the angels and archangels had never heard before because it was just for her his delightful daughter was home was home so we wait here we wait here Learning to walk and follow Jesus, learning to see discipleship as an opportunity of mutual delight. Because while we look forward to the day when he will sing over us and our tears will be gone, no, right now he's singing over you, friends. He's not waiting for some day. He's singing over you now. His promises are already true in Christ Jesus. Already now, the death of Jesus on the cross has ended your blood feud with God. Already now, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead means sin has been paid for. Death has no final say over you. Your doubt, your sin, your rebellion, your faithlessness, they are real enemies, but they don't stand a chance to your daddy against the relentless pursuit of a warrior king who was once crowned with thorns. Your sins are forgiven. Your blood guilt paid for. Your unfaith has been redeemed. Your bitter tears of anger and doubt and shame are wiped away. Already now, you are forgiven. Already now, you have been brought home. Already now, your father, the king, rejoices over you with singing. Already now, and yet, and yet, yet's a good word, because now is not as good as it's going to get. So we follow Jesus. We abide with him. And if we're courageous enough, we depend on him. Because he, he's longing to hold you, to rejoice over you, his daughter, his son, with loud singing. And nobody, nobody, nobody can stop him from doing so because the battle's already been won. We're just waiting for the party to start.